Well, we are indeed in the Advent season, and I'd just like to bring out a a couple of verses here in Isaiah chapter 9, actually. Isaiah chapter 9. Well-known verses, and I'm sure you're very welcome to look them up if you'd like to. It's uh, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it, with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. Amen. The zeal of the Lord of... This is what we need, isn't it? (laughs) Hallelujah. Have you ever started a project, but somehow it's fallen by the wayside, you got distracted, other things have come along, Uh, you know, you run out of uh, ideas or whatever... The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God is going to finish and complete what he has set out to do. We know that Jesus was sent into this world the first time. We'll look a little bit at this later on. But he came, didn't he, to, in obedience to his Father. And he completed the mission. Do you remember on the cross at Calvary, Jesus said, It is finished. Paid in full. Tastella, I think, is the original language there, but it, it's apparently, so Dave Hunt tells us, it's an accountancy term, and it means paid in full. You know, it's wonderful, isn't it, if you're in, in debt or something, and you pay that debt, and you get the piece of paper back, you know, with, with all your debt, it says paid in full, you know, a nice sort of stamp at the bottom there. You're all right. No, what God has purposed, he's going to carry out, and that's something that we rejoice in. And... Um, as I say, we will be looking at this in a few moments. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. This is what I like about this, because it shows us uh, what is going to happen, uh, the nature of it, who is going hap- to perform it. Of course, it's this child that's born, the son is given. We know that's the Lord Jesus. Uh, the government shall appear upon his shoulder. What a relief that is, isn't it? When we look around, not just our own government, but other Governments around the world are in disarray, aren't they? But during this time, we believe it's the millennial reign of our Lord, will be in complete um, uh, settled upon his shoulders there. And his name, it's interesting here, because the names uh, that we're given here are really sort of descriptions, aren't they? Uh, wonderful, counsellor, yes, the, the, that's a title, isn't it? Um, what else do we have here? The mighty God. Well, Jesus is part of the Godhead, we know that. The everlasting Father, again, we rejoice in the um, eternity that Jesus is, because when he came to bring salvation, he didn't come to bring a temporary salvation. It wasn't something that's here today and gone tomorrow. It's something that lasts eternally, hallelujah. And he's the Prince of Peace. That's what we're looking for in this world. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yes, we're into the Advent season, and you can see from the hymn so far, we're thinking very much about the first Advent. Uh, Even that um, reading from Isaiah was to do with the first Advent, unto us as child is born, and so forth. But also, there is this aspect of the second Advent as well. So, as with a lot of Bible prophecy, of course, there can be more than one fulfilment. The various passages announcing God's intervening in the affairs of man and sending his beloved son into this world is no exception. Uh, We're in the Advent season, and now is a good time to consider the two Advents of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Let's reflect on the circumstances and indeed the geopolitical conditions 
which were prevalent at the time of God sending Jesus, his precious son, to fallen mankind. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Okay, verse 3, it all went to be taxed. Every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Well, this is wonderful, isn't it? Because we get an insight into the circumstances surrounding the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Israel was under Roman occupation and was included in this global edict that all the world should be taxed. A taxing, as you know from your own experience, taxing involves some form of census or registration or an identification uh, verification. And in order to comply, the citizen was required, in this case, to travel to his own city. And so we have the record here of the journey to Bethlehem that Joseph undertook with Mary his espoused wife being great with child. Not easy, but he dutifully obeyed and submitted to the emperor's decree. Uh, Those then were the circumstances of the first advent, and it reminds me of the Jubilee. Quoting from the internet as to what the Jubilee is about, we've come across it, of course, in the Old Testament as well. The Jubilee is the year at the end of the seven cycles of Shemitah, that's sabbatical years, and according to biblical regulations, had a special impact on the ownership and the management of land in the land of Israel. According to the book of Leviticus, Hebrew slaves and prisoners would be freed, debts would be forgiven, and the mercies of God would be particularly manifest. How... I'm sure they look forward to the Jubilee. Of course, um, we have here um, in uh, the accounts that Luke gives of the taxing here of, of, um, well, Joseph and Mary in in this case, is that uh, it's one of revision, or reversion, I should say, and reset. We hear something about reset, don't we, in today's age, uh, from a globalist point of view. So we have, even at that time, that when the Lord Jesus, just before he was born, there was this edict, and this, the folks had to revert back to their own um, uh, city. Circumstances are restored to their original condition as they were seven years ago. <clears throat> because um, Julius Caesar proclamation affected... Joseph and Mary, yes, <laughs> Mary also was of the lineage of David, meaning that they were compelled to return to their ancestral city. And this is why it reminds us of the Jubilee. But of course, it isn't the Jubilee. <laughs> in fact, in contrast to God ordained Jubilee, uh, this was an occasion for taxing rather than cancelling or being forgiven debts. So this then illustrates the power and the authority imposed by the dictatorial Roman regime, which came into power 27 years before the first advent and lasted another 476 years or so. It is one of several Gentile regimes which have dominated Israel over the centuries and is depicted in the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That's in Daniel chapter 2. 
Jesus spoke about these regimes in his Olivet Discourse. Um, again, this is uh, recounted in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 24. And uh, you'll see there just that brief reference that they shall fall by the edge of the sword. This is the Jews, of course. They shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Let's put, remember that one. <clears throat> so although I believe the Bible is about God's dealings with his chosen people, the Jews, we have wonderful insights into the divine nature of God and commentary on his provision for all of his creation, Jew and Gentile alike. Primarily, we have the gospel, that's good news, of redemption of mankind through the, our Lord Jesus Christ. We have his incarnation and his first advent, uh, which occurred during the times of the Gentiles. Uh, that means, of course, their prominence in world history, the times of the Gentiles. The book of Daniel is a good source of information about the times of the Gentiles and about their dynasties, and particularly in chapter 2. So let's look a little bit at this image then that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about in Daniel chapter 2. I trust I've got the right reference here. Daniel chapter 2. Again, a few verses. You might know that Daniel, um, he was captive uh, actually in the king's household. Um, he was treated well, as far as we know. And... Um, there he was in the household, and this great king had a dream, and he wouldn't tell anybody what the dream was. No, if they were clever men, <laughs> then they would know what the dream was, <laughs> but they weren't. Only Daniel could actually relate it, and it wasn't Daniel, it was the God of Daniel, and Daniel gives God the glory, of course. But we're picking up this um, account in verse 31. Channel chapter 2, verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly, and his thighs of brass. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them in pieces. This was, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And this is the dream. Verse 36, just breaking off halfway through verse 36. So here we have a compact overview of the history of the world uh, of Gentile empires. And I take a general understanding of the various metals to represent First of all, uh, Babylon, gold, uh, Medo-Persia, silver, Greece, brass, and Rome being the iron. We can use this image then as a timeline marking off the subject of our thoughts today, which uh, revolves around the first and the second advents. We know that Jesus was born into a world dominated by Rome 27 years after its commencement, so we can place the first advent near the top of the iron legs. The description of the Roman Empire is dismissed in four words. Legs of iron. His legs of iron. <laughs> That's the Roman Empire there. Having authenticated the dream... Daniel goes on to give the meaning, and we pick up again in verse 36. 
and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Now, here we've given an intriguing, some intriguing, if not mystifying, detail in this description. Um, I'm highlighting three aspects which are relevant to our subject. First, and that we, our subject, of course, is to do with the two advents. The first advent is of the, of course, the, um, the first aspect is the first advent, if you like, the circumstances and the timing which we dealt with earlier. Um, the second aspect, chronologically speaking, is in the form of a question, where are we? Well, as we celebrate and remember our Lord's first coming, we're looking forward to his second coming. He hasn't come back yet, so we must be living in the period between the two advents. And my assessment is that we're going through the foot or, or feet period. Why do I say this? Apart from using logic to scrutinise the image as a timeline, the first advent uh, way up near the top of the legs, and the second advent as yet to be the rock which destroys the image, we are living in uncertain and weakly constituted, constituted um, times, represented by the feet, part of iron and part of clay. This speaks of instability and vulnerability and preparation for a downfall, well, I think so at some stage. Now that we're still here, though, do we understand what the iron and clay mean? And uh, for that, i have using, obviously, not scripture, because scripture isn't clear about what the iron and the clay is in that part. We know that the iron in the legs is to do with the Roman Empire. Some people talk about the revived Roman Empire as they think about the iron mixed with clay. But let's just conjecture for a moment then what the meaning might be of the iron and the clay. Yes, iron, Rome. Clay, rebellious, barbaric hordes. I believe that um, uh, Rome fell, didn't it? Because um, it, was, it was overthrown by barbarians of, of one sort or another. Were they Visigoths or something? Again, I'm not clear of history, but I do know that the Roman Empire, as was, 
is fallen, but as I say, there is this aspect of um, strands of it, as it were, being coming through even in our own day. I mean, we have the Club of Rome, for instance, in our own day and age, don't we? Um, okay, and another thought is iron representing sovereignty and clay representing democracy. A government of the people, by the people, for the people. Well, um, we can see that that uh, doesn't mix very well, um, but obviously there is a semblance of trying to sort of merge it to make something of it. Right. Fourthly here, uh, we have the iron uh, metallic mechanical robots, or AI. In other words, uh, iron being sort of like physically, if you like, um, uh, some form of um, devices that uh, can be put on man, as it were, uh, or even outside of man. Of course, we've seen um, autonomous robots, haven't we? Uh, and uh, artificial intelligence, of course, be, be getting uh, stronger and stronger by the day, as it were. And, of course, if we then contrast that with clay as being the human flesh uh, made out of the dust of the earth, well, w we are, aren't we? Uh, although even iron... <laughs> it's interesting, even iron came from the earth as well, didn't it? OK, carrying on. Uh, iron, dictatorial overlords controlling the clay, which... Uh, could be, again, as we think of AI and what implanted into the brains of mankind to control them. I believe that Elon Musk is in the process of trying to perfect this. Um, again, iron being supernatural intervention. Uh, people think that, as in the days of Noah, that there was some um, supernatural intervention, perhaps Nephilim or so forth. Will that happen again? Well... The clay, of course, being the seed of men. And lastly here, again, you can probably carry on with your own conjectures here. Uh, iron representing tyranny, clay representing liberty. <clears throat> and again, when we look throughout the world, we can see that um, some areas are ruled in, by draconian uh, regimes... Uh, whereas others um, uh, believe that they've got a form of liberty, although, we again, we can see this liberty, as it were, just sort of draining away in, in places. So, we're not yet at the toes period, but I believe that we're on the slippery slope down from the ankle toward the toes. My further understanding is that the toes represent ten Gentile kings, yet to be revealed by the Antichrist, and the toes are one hour long. Why do I say this? Well, again, uh, in Daniel's uh, book, num uh, chapter 7, we see, read this in verse 24. And the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And again, this is confirmed in the Revelation chapter 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So it would appear that these Bible verses... Uh, demonstrate and show that the Antichrist is in power um, in, in this period of time uh, as we get toward the, the toes here. Um, and this is supported, uh, uh, the, the Antichrist is supported by the ten kings, although their power is very limited duration. They're only allowed to reign uh, because of the Antichrist, and that's only for one hour, it says there. <laughs> So we come to our last consideration then, because once uh, the, we've considered the whole sort of image and we're down to the toes, the tip of the toes, that's the end of the Gentile empires and dynasties. Because what happens? It says in Daniel chapter 2, 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, 
and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Again, in Isaiah that we originally read this tonight, it talks about the increase of his government, there shall be no end. So there we have the everlasting nature of the kingdom. It comes as a rock uh, and uh, Im- impacts the, um, the toes uh, and the bottom of the image here. Despite the reports of the decline of Christianity in this country, which you may have heard about this week, if you're a Christian, you are part of God's eternal kingdom. Jesus, the kingdom, is the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. To use a, a topical metaphor for the typology, uh, he, uh, that's Jesus, of course, is the dynamic striker, footballer, who targets the static, inanimate, inanimate goalkeeper, impacting his feet, demolishing and blowing away the residue of the Gentile kingdoms Nothing is left. And setting up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. I've got to ask you tonight, is Jesus at the centre of your life? Is he your centre forward, again, to coin a a topical uh, footballing term? It's an interesting... um, a sort of picture that one can get from this Nebuchadnezzar's dream of, the, of being in this um, static um, image. Um, there it is, um, uh, top down, wonderful gold at the top, but yet nothing but iron and clay and, and, and weakness at the bottom. And that stone doesn't impact the head, it impacts the bottom, and yet it does demolish not just the bottom but the whole lot going to nothing and indeed that stone which as I say we believe is is the the kingdom of our Lord actually gets bigger and bigger fills the whole world hallelujah the everlasting kingdom and really the, the, the message tonight from this aspect of considering these two advents is where do we stand are we uh on the Lord's side as it were Are we part of him? Are we um, followers of the Lord Jesus? Or are we more interested in the gold and silver and the things of this world, which, as we've seen from that image, is going to come to nothing one day? Are we part of God's eternal kingdom? May that be so, as we examine ourselves very uh, honestly and carefully before Almighty God. These are just a few thoughts regarding the first and the second advent and considering what it has to do with us, the relevance of these two advents. May the Lord bless those few words and thoughts to our mind tonight.